Board President Thayer Joshua? Here. Board Member Anne Marie Manny? Here. Board Member Alyssa Malaspina? Here. Um, I am getting Miss Wright on. She's having trouble with the link, so she'll be in in a minute. Board Member Chris Saban? Pick the same. How did you go? We'll we'll note when he joins. Okay. Board member Aaron Siders. Here. Board member Courtney Winkfield. Here. Board member Johanna Wright. Not yet. Yeah. And we will note when um, when both board members Sabin and Wright arrive. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, over to you, Dr. Freeman. Thank you very much, Board President Joshua. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Mr. Preston, can we get a confirmation you're good? It's not a good sign. Looks like Principal Sanchez. I don't know. Principal Sanchez. <laughs> Sorry, we might have to flip flop. Mr. Preston is having a little trouble. Are you sure? Can you hear me okay? I can hear. Hello? Chris? I can hear you. Can you hear my feed at all or no? We can hear you okay. now. Uh, we can hear you. Okay. We can hear you. Okay, okay. so Mr. Preston uh, is here tonight. Hold on, let me, Chris, let me just introduce you. Um, Mr. Preston's here tonight to give uh, the um, committee an update uh, on the work that we're doing around um, the Amistad curriculum. And uh, we've been making uh, continued progress and we wanted to bring Mr. Preston back to update everyone on the work that we've been doing, give some exemplars of things that have been happening and uh, we're really proud of the work that Mr. Preston has um, been helping to lead in the district. So, Mr. Preston. Great, thank you very much. I'm gonna pull this up, uh, my slideshow that you have uh, for you now. Um, share my screen here. Is this audio still okay for you? Yeah, okay. Sorry, join the meeting. Yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to update you on a few things uh, since we last spoke during the summer. Um, and uh, as noted here, the first two slides are um, just reminders of what was shared at the time. Um, all social studies curriculum is uh, approved and aligned to Amistad. Uh, K-12 grade level proficiencies were created by me in 2019. They are embedded in every curriculum guide by unit. I will say that when the Amistad curriculum uh, was created, it did not allow for any grade level proficiencies. Uh, it allowed districts to go ahead and make those particular choices. Uh, you will see tonight some of those um, choices and how that rolls out in terms of specific lesson plans um, by grade level. Uh, but that is one thing that we've taken a step further that the Amistad has or the state has provided as well. Um, one other course that we, uh, I know that I'd mentioned earlier that we introduced was uh, Caribbean Studies. Actually, Mr. Sanchez and I were in that class watching a fantastic presentation today. Um, and another slide too that um, I wanted to share with you is something that I shared um, in August deals with the actual units of instruction and how this actually goes beyond uh, what was stated in the New Jersey standards by addressing topics um, with specificity that were Afrocentric, Afro uh, Atlantic world centric, uh, and got away from a Western dominated uh, narrative. And so this begins as early as grade four, uh, when we look at the peopling of Africa and uh, the Americas prior to the arrival of the Europeans. And so the Europeans are viewed and portrayed as somebody who come into something in a place that's already pre-existing with their own civilizations, ways of life, and ways of approaching the world. Um, 
also in grade five, which is the second year in a three year history course in this middle cluster. Um, these particular topics and lessons um, address um, the standards of Amistad as well. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Hold on just a sec. Um, somehow this just came up blurry, but you have uh, this presentation uh, before you. Um, unit one in grades four and five are either completed or being taught right at this time. And one of the things that we've done is given specific attention to, uh, as I noted before, the empires of West Africa and um, the Columbian Exchange, and then as well as um, really teaching, I guess, what is history. And this is an in, in um, an introductory lesson about perspective, um, whose story is taught, the importance of being mindful of uh, who is not mentioned in the story, um, because history or the study of history is a, really a construction. It's not something that is just is. And so that's something that we are introducing uh, to students for the first time in grades four and five. I would say this is another talking point as far as, you know, what do we introduce uh, to students in terms of their understanding of history and conceptualization of the world? It is that one that there's conscious choices that we as educators or viewers of shows uh, realize that this is a constructed um, narrative and what's left in and what is left out is an important thing to uh, consider. Um, I'm not sure how I can make this uh, a little bit better. Uh, sample lessons that we actually are on teachers' Canvas pages right now in grade six and grade seven and grade eight are visible here. One of the things that we try and balance in grades four through uh, six in particular, which is a three-year history course, is balancing these larger events that are taking place either on continents or in regions with the individuals uh, stories of people at the time. And also, you know, with the, um, the teaching of uh, slavery and enslavement, and also balancing that with stories of agency and individuality. And I will give you a couple of examples of that as well. Uh, one, uh, another instance where we kind of take things beyond uh, what is stipulated either in the state standards in particular, um, deals with the absence of individual names and for the history standards, you will really only see four specific people mentioned, uh, Jefferson, Franklin, Washington, and Governor Livingston being the four. That is it. And what we were looking to do uh, early on in history is give students um, names and events and their stories to really teach the larger narrative that we want to portray uh, going on here. And so the story of abolitionists uh, and uh, people who are involved in civil rights and both um, people of African-American descent, African descent, and uh, whites as well who are fighting for abolition is something that we do. So Harry Tubman, Nat Turner, um, are just a few quick names um, that we would uh, mention here as well. Um, also, and you will see here at the bottom of the slideshow, um, really looking again at the empires of Africa. And so one thing that we've sought to do that didn't exist before was, you know, world history was is largely absent from a good portion of the K-5 curriculum. And so we wanted to kind of introduce that in four and five to students and then revisit that again uh, here in grade eight. Uh, at the high school level, um, these are some of the actual sample lessons from the early units of study uh, that you see here. Uh, one point of emphasis that we begin to do uh, in high school is um, really focusing on uh, race as a social construction and delving deeply uh, into issues of race and racism. Um, and so you can see these topics here. Since I can't see you, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to stop before I just kind of segue on. 
keep going, Mr. Preston. I'll ask the board members to um, use the raise hand feature and then uh, we'll I'll um, pause and direct questions as I see them come in. Thank you. Gotcha. Okay. So that's a quick overview of the, you know, the current units of study that have either just taken place or um, uh, took place at the beginning of the year in terms of the actual lessons that we were doing to meet uh, Amistad. Um, one uh, era of note that there's been a collaboration between our department um, at the high school now, and that's going to the uh, elementary schools uh, beginning in the spring, deals with a booklet, a publication that came out from Duran Head called Slavery in New Jersey, A Troubled Past. Uh, and it really focuses on this um, view of to what extent did slavery exist in the state of New Jersey and locally, and the extent to which abolition uh, took place uh, in this state as well. And so I think in June of uh, 2020, um, the Duran Hedden House had a Juneteenth celebration where these posters associated with the publication were exhibited for the first time to the public. Uh, and last month at Columbia High School in the art gallery, uh, these posters uh, were put up and we created a museum experience for our sophomores um, who are studying uh, this period in history now. And so uh, all of the teachers of U.S. history received class sets of the publication and uh, those are ready to go to fourth and fifth grade as well. So if I could, let's see if this will publish up. Yep. And so if you haven't seen this, um, I think the link is embedded in your presentation. Um, let's see if it comes up here. We really wanted to give students uh, an example of what New Jersey was like at, at this time. And I'll just scroll down here a little bit. And so in, this, in um, the state standards, it mentions nothing about uh, slavery, enslavement, or abolition in the state of New Jersey. And we wanted to take something that was typically associated with grade four and really uh, turn this focus on as well. One of the things that came about as a result of this museum experience at the high school was something uh, that you see here are um, ads for uh, capturing of enslaved people. And what teachers in the department did was they took some of these and others from a secondary source and it had students explore to what extent um, can we tell about the individual and their agency based on the uh, way that these ads were written and try to humanize and put a face on these individuals because there really was not a lot of written records of people at the time. But not only to see areas of such as Newark, of which we were part of at one point in time and this area, but also to put a humanizing face on these people and try and infer what type of life that they were trying to uh, in leave when they were trying to escape. And so I won't go into more detail here, um, but this is a collaboration we're doing with um, Durant Hedden. Um, another piece that I wanted to make mention uh, is professional development for grades four and five that took place this past month. And um, what, what I did was to kind of take the Amistad curriculum, um, provide uh, people with access to it, but also, which was a concern in the past of, you know, having a space, a safe space for teachers to feel comfortable with topics of uh, slavery and how to address that in the curriculum that we had. So in the professional development that I offered, um, which was recorded and sent to all of the schools as well, um, an organization known as Teaching Tolerance, which is now Learning for Justice, has come up with an instructional framework uh, for grades K through 12 for the teaching of hard history. And so I walked the teachers through this particular publication and how these concepts and the content within uh, relate directly to the units of study that we have. And so teachers can get a sense of here's the units that we have and uh, here's how recommendations, for example, of a key concept, um, important teaching points to emphasize, uh, and then also um, here's the essential knowledge. And so when we talk, for example, in every place in time enslaved people sought freedom, here are six different teaching points um, that we will be emphasizing in the curriculum. And so giving them an example about um, where are the topics and areas of focus, which will be embedded in the lesson plans. And then it also provides suggestions for all of us of how do I go about teaching this? 
And so when we share with teachers that students will be inspired by stories, um, students should examine historical figures who tried to rebel. There's detailed explanations about how to teach this as well. And so this is another resource for our department uh, and for the professional development that I had and then I'll be doing for the next unit of study coming up. Uh, I believe this is in the slideshow, but um, again, there were uh, resources that uh, provided for the teachers in terms of learning podcasts for their own that deal with those essential learnings. Uh, a text library that provides resources of a variety of different texts associated with the topics that they have. Uh, and an inquiry lesson that they provided that actually uh, complements very well the work that we started with the Duran Head and House and talking about um, slavery, uh, the troubled past in New Jersey. So those were just a few examples of, um, I guess, the updates that have been occurring across um, the department. Uh, let me just see here. And just a, I guess, one quick um, example as well in terms of transferring the information found in Google Drive into uh, Canvas and Atlas for teachers uh, as well. And so, uh, you know, there's a lesson uh, in grade five on the Haitian Revolution. And what I started to do for the teachers in, in every lesson, um, they wanted a one-stop shop. So when they looked at the lesson plan, which was listed here, then they could go to the resource page, which was listed here. And their, the actual, whether it's lecture notes, whether it's uh, readings for the students, whether it's the slideshow, presentations, all of those are here for them. In addition to um, a lesson bank, or I'm sorry, a resource bank that's being compiled, not only for them uh, as teachers, but also students. And so teachers had shared that, you know, where do they go to get this background information? And so I'm building these uh, for um, teachers by individual lesson, so that when they go to their particular place, and say, okay, so this is lesson four of this particular unit. All the things that they will need are kind of attached here in that particular link. So um, I think I will take questions at this time uh, and refer to anything that you have questions about. Board Member Wingfield. Uh, Mr. President, thank you so much for the presentation, and I really appreciate the information, especially you shared about the way that you're using professional development to support um, the teachers in teaching some of this really hard history. Um, I'm curious mm -hmm. how the district is using um, additional professional learning opportunities, such as implicit bias or other cultural competency trainings to ensure that there's a link between what we're expecting um, our history teachers in particular to teach in the Amistad curriculum and how we expect them to utilize the tools in these implicit bias and cultural competency trainings to ensure that they're, they're prepared for what may come up in the classroom and also feel empowered to be able to address um, some of what the students may bring up. So I, I think there's two practical examples that just jump into mind about that. In my middle school department meeting today, um, I just thought it was an opportune time. We had about, we did a half of that period with Nizella, and then the other half, we actually looked back at our individual lessons uh, and the PD that we've kind of done and tied that to as kind of a reflection of, so here's the lessons that I had posted on Canvas, and here's the actual wording of the language by the unit. And so, how is that that those kind of, you know, meet and where don't they? And then this other aspect that came up, especially in um, the skills section, in terms of the skills for um, different perspectives, um, in terms of, um, you know, what do we include, what don't we include? That was a particular talking point on the slide that I had for fourth and fifth grade. Um, but in terms of tying that to the um, explicit implicit bias trainings, uh, that's something that I can follow up with you in the spring as, you know, I shift, I don't want to say shift my focus, but, you know, sharpen the pencil as far as that, that's concerned. Uh, the other piece too, in my 
fifth grade um, PD this past month, um, revisiting with them before they begin, about two or three weeks before they begin teaching that unit and really unpacking that unit with the teachers, potential pitfalls, uh, things when we talk about, you know, what to include and what not, really walking teachers through, um, you know, what those areas might be. Uh, one of the things about the lesson plans that I really tried to do is provide like a contextual paragraph for teachers. And the thought in mind about that was that if I was brand new and was really looking at this for the first time, I have no sense, I can follow the lesson plan and execute it, but to what extent do I have an understanding of where this fits within a larger picture and kind of where this is going? And so that piece within the lesson plans is something that looking to kind of give that attention as well. But I'd be happy to follow up with you again, you know, in the spring with regard to that. Thank you so much. One other, mm -hmm. one other piece, Board Member Wingfield, that um, you know, Mr. Mr. Preston, I mean, all the stuff that he talked about, you know, is content area specific. But uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing this year, um, kind of restructuring PLCs, um, taking the recommendations of Dr. Fergus. Um, implementing the CNI department's been implementing protocols into the PLCs, but the different buildings have been um, self selecting topics. We've been allowing them to self select topics and, and get into groups. And so a lot of what you mentioned um, have been topics at, uh, at many of the buildings. So they're making the connections um, to some of the professional development work and how they can tie it into their classroom work as well. So it's happening in multiple ways. If I could just piggyback real quick on that. Um, so there was a, a reading group that um, I would say about seven social studies teachers and I um, conducted last beginning last spring and we read CAST uh, as a department. Um, and so uh, once this PL first round of PLC work and protocols are done, uh, doing something within our department with regard to the implications for um, us as educators, um, generally, implications for us as educators in this district and implications for our students as learners as it relates to that particular book. Um, and then the next book up slated for uh, January of 2022 is um, How the Word is Passed. Um, that is our next book. And we've actually had members of uh, the English department at the high school and members of middle school social studies department join in. So we've probably gone to about 10 members now. So. Just wanted to piggyback on that as well. Thank you, Board Member May. Thank you, Mr. Preston. I just wanted to understand how all this integrates into Atlas so that um, one, we capture all this work in this database and two, our um, parents have access to these resources as well. Um, so, I think the work right now is to take the individual lesson plans uh, and put those in Atlas and Canvas. I think the actual, what we've agreed to as a district to provide for um, parents and families and students is Atlas is what we have in there in terms of um, the unit plans themselves. Um, but in terms of resources for parents and students, I'm happy to kind of, um, you know, take lead on that and, and make that um, a situation that we can, you know, make available to folks because there's a lot out there for sure. But that hasn't been, you know, yeah, decided yet in terms of how and over net board member been... Manny, over the next over the next couple months, um we we started some initial meetings um with a internal committee to talk about um a project plan for future um role uh, future phases of Atlas. The next step is going to be, as, as Mr. Preston mentioned, uh, lesson plan repository. So there's gonna be a lot of internal resources that are gonna be provided to staff members where they'll be able to share ideas and collaborate internally. Um, the lessons won't be shared publicly, but as Mr. Preston said, we can definitely work on um, uh, different vehicles to get those um, resources out to uh, community members as well. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Preston. Uh, next topic, 
Good thing. If I can just real quick, I'll be two seconds to jump in. I believe if you if the public view of Atlas does show the connections to Amistad. So if you go in as a public um, person mm -hmm. and on, on off of the uh, website, each uh, unit you should actually see the connections to Amistad. And we also have LGBTQ and Holocaust and all of the other state uh, mandated. Uh, I guess, Ms. Bonner, that's what I was worried about was that if we've created one static set of resources in Atlas, yet we've done all this work to provide additional resources to our teachers, like somewhere, like we can't have duplicate of work because otherwise the whole thing won't be consistent. So Correct. that was just mm -hmm. my question. Okay. I have, I have a, a quick question. Um, uh, can board, you tell board me member Wright, please, for one second, I see board member Cuddles also waving their hand, uh, so it's going to go to them first and just looking for both as well as all of us just use the hand raise functions. It's easier for me to manage. Appreciate it. Thanks. So board member Cuddle and then board member Wright. Thank you, President Joshua. I have no um, hand raise function currently right now. I've looked on uh, the whole entire WebEx platform. It's not accessible to me right now. So if you look I, under the three dots, you should I looked under the three, three dots. dots. I did look under the three dots. Uh, it's not accessible to me. So, um, just one flagging that uh, right. Now. If I do under the three dots, it says switch audio, connect to a, a video, copy, and there is no option, which was not like I think this meeting. So uh, I don't know if it's. The meeting set up. Hover uh, over your hover over your name in the panelist section, and then you should see a hand. Hover over your name, a hand should show up. We, Go to the list of panelists. All right, just ask your question in the meantime. We can work on it afterwards, but that's yeah. What well, be. so I understand how this works, and it worked previously in our previously meeting. I'm just letting you know right now that it's not accessible. So. Um, which is why I was using my hand um, in the feature uh, in the window. Um, that being said, uh, to move forward, um, uh, tech issues aside, um, no, uh, so I mean, I, I appreciate the presentation. It was great. Uh, similar to board member Manny's point um, around uh, ensuring that the curriculum was showing all aspects like we're not we're not taking departments um status here in the future if we have aapi it's here the lgbt curriculum persons with disabilities is here that we there's a clear understanding that there's a ebb and flow and how it interacts with everything that we do is important because that's the intent of all this curriculum that we are doing that's diverse, um, that is intersectional. So wanting to be mindful of that um, and making sure that we are not just um, trying to check off benchmarks for curriculum diversity, but we are showing true intersectionality. So thank you. Thank you. And if you click over, you hover over the reactions. If you click on that, the first one all the way up at the top is raise hand. For those who are having trouble finding it, uh, board member Wright. You said all the way at the top, because I got the same thing. No, as I said at did. the bottom. At the bottom, you'll see if you click on reactions and you go up to the top, there's a raise hand. The reactions is a smiley face next to share on the screen. Mine wasn't working at the time, President Joshua. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Go ahead, board member Wright. Okay. Um, uh, so it's great that the resources are there, but how do we uh, ensure the staff, sure that the staff knows how to use these resources well? And and uh, the other question I have is, um, um, I may not have heard you, but are the PLCs during the week dedicated to this? Um. Thank you for the question. So with regard to the use of the resources well, uh, the purpose of my initial PD was to share the resources uh, with the teachers, show how they related to the actual units themselves, 
and then show how they would be embedded within the individual lesson plans. And so one thing that I didn't mention, but I think over the course of last month, I met with uh, grade level teams at South Mountain, and I'll be looking to reach out and meet with the teachers a couple of weeks before in grades four and five, where they meet um, prior to them beginning their second unit to kind of go in the weeds with regard to the resources, the lessons, the things to teach, recommended practices, what not to teach. So that's really a specific granular way, I think, to sit there and, and really um, show how to use the resources, model some of these learning pieces as well. Um, in my high school and middle school department meetings, of which occur uh, one to two times a month, um, we have those conversations monthly. Um, like I mentioned um, before, what we just did with the middle school teachers uh, today. Um, one of the things that I believe took place, uh, well, I can say explicitly, was that, you know, with the pandemic in grades six and eight and nine and 12, all of those grade level teachers met and shared all of their lessons uh, and ideas on uh, Google Drive. And so, yes, while they're familiar and use Atlas and, you know, all of their lessons are on Canvas, you know, they are using those Google Drive shared folders for their lesson plans and discussing that regularly. Um, so that's happening more so uh, in grades six through 11. The work is really for me in four or five, and I'm happy to follow up with you uh, with that specific question um, in the spring. With regards to the PLCs, I, that's been a district initiative thus far. Um, so. Thanks. Right. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Can you tell me how you monitor the, the progress and the trends as they self-select the topics? If they self-select the topics? I just want to make sure I heard yeah, your question. Yeah, if they self-select the topics, uh, how, do, how, do, how do you monitor the progress or the trends? Well, they, that's they for Dr. Friedman. Um, self I'm sorry, that's for Dr. Oh. Friedman, uh, Chris. Oh. Oh. Sorry. Yes, remember, right. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, we collect the data. Uh, we have a Google form that the, uh, that the PLCs um, are filling out on the topics. Um, we were initially doing, uh, to teach them the protocol, we were doing an initial book study with them. So starting this month, they're gonna be breaking into their building level topics that they have been planning over the past couple months. So we're gonna be collecting the data of who is in the PLCs, the topics, um, the topic that was discussed and the, um, the uh, results and suggestions that came out of it. So we're get, we by doing that in Google Forms, we're able to collect all of that in a um, in a pretty um, organized Excel spreadsheet and kind of see the trends. And in addition to that, I meet with the principals once a month and we talk about the uh, different topics uh, that the um, buildings uh, were suggesting. I've, I've actually been working with the assistant principals to kind of oversee the um, PLCs and the, the assistant principals have actually created their own PLC to uh, model the protocols and discuss different topics amongst themselves as well. So uh, we can update you along the way of the different topics that they are um, kind of self-selecting. Um, but we we felt it necessary to collect that data from the uh, CNI office. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, Ms. Preston. Um, Dr. Freeman, uh, on to this next one is thank you, the President Council. Joshua. What, thank you, one thing I just wanted to mention Tonight, to uh, Board Member Tuttle. Real quick. Um, Uh, for board member Cuddle and, and, the, and the collective board, um, one of the best features of Atlas is that we can run um, uh, reports on where and how often standards are used. So uh, we can drill down into particular standards, uh, you know, whether it's Amistad or LGBTQ standards that are embedded into our curriculum, whether it's math or ELA, science, social studies standards. And uh, we can run reports on 
where the standards are covered in our curriculum, what grade levels, uh, what content areas, if it's cross-curricular, and you know, by running those reports, we're able to look at things like formative and summative assessments, state testing, um, and see where our strengths and weaknesses are. But to your point about the you know intersectionality of, uh, we can really look at how often and where um, standards are covered, and if there are gaps that we're finding, we can address those from a, a curricular standpoint with supervisors. All right, thank you. It is seven. Uh, one member, Malspina. Yes. Um, thank you for the information, um, Dr. Freeman. I, I, you just stated that you are you, you can run reports using Atlas. Um, my concern is mm -hmm. that if I am correct, we don't have lesson plans in Atlas right now. So while you can run reports telling the standards that are being addressed that should be addressed. We really don't know if we are actually hitting those standards since we do not have lesson plans in them to know if the teachers are actually teaching the standards. Just because the standards might be in the curriculum doesn't exactly mean that they're being taught in the classroom. And that's true. Um... And to your point, as I mentioned, uh, the lesson plan feature was uh, was uh, as we were building out this project plan was always a year two uh, feature. We needed to work on getting the units of study in a consistent format and into Atlas, which took a significant amount of time. Uh, the pacing guide, you know, kind of shows us where the standards and and when the you know where and how often and. Um, when the standards should be covered, but as we drill down to the lesson plan level, and one of the things that we need to work on with uh, Sumea and come to some understanding is that there's no common lesson plan template in the district uh, at current time. So we need to come to some sort of consensus and agreement how we're going to put that into Atlas and what we're exactly going to be looking for. Um, the framework that we use, uh, the UBD framework, kind of lends itself to building out lesson plans around those areas, but we need to come to some sort of consensus. And we started those conversations now so we can work on it during the spring so we can be up and running in the fall. But um, I, I agree with your point that as we get more granular, we'll be able to get a more accurate read how often those standards are covered. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, over to CHS. Okay. And Dr. Freeman, just a quick note, it is 7.13, so that was 33 minutes. I just want to tighten these okay. up a little bit so we can uh, stay on task. Absolutely. So, principal, uh, I, we invited Principal Sanchez this evening. He's going to uh, briefly talk about three areas that were brought forward um, by uh, the curriculum committee. Uh, talking about um, student touchstones and whether they uh, students have all met with advisors um, and or trusted adults. Uh, that's a follow up to a question that we had several months ago. We're going to briefly dive into uh, first period marking uh, first uh, first grading period um, results and do a brief analysis of that. And then we're going to talk briefly about the CHS school profile and where we are with that, which is also a follow up to some previous conversations. So Principal Sanchez. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Freeman. So I just want to kind of walk you through the presentation. Um, right. If we go to the next slide, just um, gives you uh, some information. I I've, I've actually you stole my uh, line here of what we're going to be looking at the four uh, elements. So why don't we go to the next slide? Actually, board member Sabin um, asked about the Caribbean uh, studies program when I was last here. So I just wanted to add something very quickly. Um, and I, I popped in two or three times uh, um, so far this this semester. I look forward to I'm going to be team teaching a class um, in the in that course with Ms. Karras, who is doing an incredible job in creating this new program. So what you see here, uh, Jillian and Katie are uh, 
they were holding information sessions. We had three information sessions today. And in the second marking period, the students in this class um, focused on student inquiry and some, as, as Mr. Preston mentioned, right? The focus is on agency. Um, and this was uh, a lesson on resistance or a research assignment on resistance. If you go to the next slide, I just want to break down. Uh, we have two of the semester courses in our inaugural year this year. So there's two sections of fall board member saving and a spring. Um, there are about 40 students in the two sections. You asked for a breakdown. Black students make up about 64% of the students in this class. Um, mixed race 11%, which is what we use um, in power school. Uh, these definitions white is 11% Hispanic is 9% and Asian is 6%. So, uh, the slides will have that broken down in the notes, but I just wanted to, um. To answer that question for you from last time, if we go to the next slide. Um, oh, I, I, I want to thank, uh, Dr. Friedman here and, uh, board member cuddle. Who uh, talked board member cuddle, uh. If you recall, you brought up a dual enrollment possibilities um, and you gave an example of something that's happening in Newark. And so um, thanks to your suggestion, we are looking into uh, some of these courses from the equity lab, right? So the equity lab is a uh, educational consortium that then works with um, some incredible colleges and universities. If you could see just some from here, Howard University, Princeton, Wharton, um Stanford so we're going to be looking at bringing these in so to include to add to our dual enrollment that's something Dr. Freeman has um really uh suggested and we are uh, in, in excited about it and so I just wanted to give a shout out to um board member Cuddle for for bringing that up to us uh this this possibility and hopefully we we will uh be moving forward with them next year so it's very exciting um, so now let's get to these specific questions. Um, again, talking about our touchstones or when do our um, counselors speak with our students? Um, just so you know, there's the website is right there. It's a brand, it's it's revamped um, counseling website. Really proud of Miss Ballasone and her counselors, and specifically also. Um, Miss Easton, who is our social worker, uh, who runs our social work intern program. And then, of course, also Miss Hicks, who uh, works with Mac and other additional programming in the counseling annex. So I just wanted to point this out. If, if any board members haven't yet seen it, uh, the links are there for the counseling department. You can also find a really neat brochure that walks parents through the various um, uh, counseling um, interventions or supports that we have. If you go to the next slide, Ms. Bodner, I can give you an example of the two um, initial, right? These are, these are, this is where our first intervention level is, right? Um, well, obviously first is high school counselors, but in addition to our high school counselors, we have a team of, of um, counselors that can help um, our students in need, both academically as well as emotionally um, so, for example, here you'll see the high school social work intern program and the student assistant counselor is kind of a description of that. Also, in, in the handout, you'll see that we have um, right there on this website, parents can uh, receive a list of, of mental health resources for their students, for their children, excuse me, for their children as well. But to get to the meat of your question in the next slide, I just want to remind our, our board members that our counselors met with our freshmen from the first week of school. Um, in addition to that, then they spent um, much of the fall with our seniors. That makes sense, of course, right? Because they're focusing on their college and career meetings, making sure that they are ready, that they have their letters of recommendation, they have their um, application set, or at least geared up, and they also are looking at their grades. They work hand in hand also with our assistant principal, Ms. Butler, who is also a uh, part of that process. Uh, sophomore and juniors met at the very end of the first marking period and the beginning of the second marking period. Uh, and now 
what are they doing? They're meeting with freshmen once again. So, right, because the freshmen met in that first week. So we're kind of going all the way back uh, to the beginning. Now, this is, these are uh, mandatory touches, right? This, this is our, our counselors reaching out to them. We make sure that it happens in classes so that um, those students do appear, right? Um, and, and we don't have to make, perhaps go find those students. This is all in addition, of course, to the INRS meetings, um, any other counseling meetings that they have to attend with specific students, working with case managers, but we're talking about grade level um, themes and the kind of lessons or plans that they work with Ms. Ballison to tackle. Uh, I do want also just to point out that we do have uh, this, this whole week, we have meet and greets, not just with our students, but with parents. So last year we made a great step forward with uh, registration for next year's classes, right? Um, that we invited parents to the process. Well, now we're doing that right here at the end of the first marking period. Again, um, a lot more collaboration with our home community and that's what we know uh, will be successful for our students. So um, the parents receive this from the counseling annex. Um, parents can click Obviously, this is a presentation, but um, those were live links and uh, can click on there to get those Zoom lessons. So, I'm sorry, Zoom um, or WebEx uh, links um, and entrances. So, we're competing with the fabulous Ms. Renee Johnson, our brand new counselor, as well as Ms. Handler. So, um, hopefully, this is recorded and, and those parents can also come here um, to watch this. So, if you look at our next slide, uh, so I hope that answered those questions about when our parents um, meeting with um, our, um, or sorry, our counselors are meeting with our uh, students. In addition to that, we had a question about the Columbia High School uh, profile. We updated it over the summer. We, uh, Ms. Ballison and myself, we, we looked at some best practice um, school profiles. We, we added a lot of the SAT, ACT scores and AP scores that weren't there previously and definitely also added a, um, a sheet of the stellar universities and colleges that our students are accepted to, which wasn't in the original um, school profile. Um, we had a, a, a small group of parents who wanted uh, perhaps to have um, certain language in there about our, our COVID uh, process. You know, I really felt that our um, profile honestly portrayed that, uh, but we, I think it's really important always to have that communication. Uh, we have uh, parent principal forums every other month. In fact, we had one just last night. Um, and so two months ago, we had that. Uh, I, I said to parents, if they would like to, it'd be great if we could form um, some common language that we can all agree to. Uh, that was done and it has been updated. So the Columbia High School profile, you can always find it right there at that link, which is on the school counseling website under um, the senior college uh, jumpstart section. So I just wanted to point out it's it's there and it's updated. If uh, Ms. Bodner, if you can go to the next page, the next slide, that's where the specific um, website will look like. It'll say Senior College Jumpstart. Again, brand new initiative by our counseling department, which is a handbook for our students and parents on what students should do uh, during the uh, college application process. And so um, it's right after that. And we also, I just wanna point out one more um, uh, initiative that we did for our seniors. Uh, we we thought about it last year and we created it this year. So it's the first time Ms. Butler and myself and I give uh, great credit to Ms. Butler for continuing to update it and to be communicating with their senior parents. Um, but we have a senior website now where it's a repository of all the important information that seniors need, whether it's yearbook, whether it's gonna be prom, uh, college application process, to, uh, graduation. So all of it is there and, and updated. So. Um, I think probably many schools rely on like parent Facebook pages and things like that, but this is uh, 
you know, from the school. And so we're really excited about that. And you can also find that right there on that website. So uh, what do we have next? Uh, we're gonna talk about first marking period grades. So what we have done is if you recall, we um, last time we met, um, we were talking about how the vice principals and myself, we meet weekly and we talk about attendance, student attendance, and that's where the focus was in the beginning of the first marking period, uh, vice principals meeting with counselors, uh, with case managers, with students at risk for attendance. So if you, for example, look at our student information system, which is PowerSchool that we use, on the right-hand side, you'll see a picture right there that kind of, we can click on it and we can find our students who are at risk uh, for attendance and for grades um, or high risk, which would be a, a combination of grades and attendance. Um, and so what we, we use that to kind of uh, tackle certain um, issues or try to be proactive with our, our students. We also get a report on a daily basis from, us, from our, our system manager on attendance. Uh, but now, or at least for the, since the marking period ended, our vice principals, myself, and the supervisors have been meeting regarding um, grades. So I do want to thank Mr. Willard, who does a great job in mining um, our power school data for us. Um, and I am uh, extremely spoiled that many of our uh, fantastic supervisors are, are stationed at the high school, or at least their offices are. So obviously they're they're at the middle school, they're at middle schools, excuse me, and all the elementary schools. But having them in the high school allows us to, to meet every few weeks, every two weeks, so we can really discuss how we um, work with our teachers as well on you know student attendance and student grading. So I, I do wanna just point out, for example, um, Mr. Ms. Aboudin, right, Jamil, has done a great job in um, using Excel to figure out where we have students at risk. That would be students with a D and an F, and he could, and he's broken it down in the STEM classes uh, by course. And then we're also using that as a model for our other supervisors. Um, but we, what we've done here is kind of had with the supervisors and the vice principals a breakdown of all students with Ds and Fs. We look at percentage points, how far they were from passing, how far they were from a C. Uh, it's kind of like bubble grades. And then we meet and talk with those teachers, um, just talking about grading policies, talking about best practices. And then at the same time, our counselors with case managers, if needed or appropriate, meet with students and families. And of course, we have a, a, a dialogue between the two groups. So that's how we. Um, are tackling our first marking period grades, and we'll give you a couple of breakdowns in a moment. I also just want to add, for example, Supervisor Dr. B. Folks, who um, does a fabulous job, and, and she was looking at our STAR Renaissance tests, which is just an extra data, data point, right? It's an extra uh, point that we can look at in addition to grades um, to see if there are uh, skills intervention that would be necessary. Um, but we also added to that the, the uh, Start Strong test results, which just came out um, several weeks ago. Um, there's nothing really to look at other years, unfortunately, but it is good because it's the first year, right? And it's supposed to measure COVID gaps or gaps um, from COVID. What, although it's the first year, we can look at that and the Renaissance test together to see, for example, if intervention is needed. So these are the discussions that are happening at Columbia uh, among the supervisors, the administrative team, um, and also our teachers. If we go to the next slide, we can kind of break it down. So, uh, the I, and we could do this by by grade. And so at first, when I was looking at some of the scores, uh, for example, the ninth grade, 50, 51 percent of the ninth grade had had an A, right? And then you can see the B, C, D, F, uh, O means other. And that could be pass fail, that could be incomplete. Um, I'm not really sure how useful this would be without really looking at a comparison from a, a, a previous year. So if you go to the next slide, this is what we've done here. 
to, to make this easier. We break it down by grade again, because we really want um, to, to work with our uh, vice principals who are by grade level. They really are instructional leaders. They are the secondary um, teacher observers as well. So just so you can um, see here, I, I, picked, I picked a year that was um, obviously uh, pre-COVID. So the last year that we had uh, prior to COVID and you can see the grade breakdowns. Um, the, this is in ninth grade. Um, you can see that 63% of grades in 2019 uh, were were AIDS, right? And right now we're at 49% or 50%. Um, and so you can then go obviously to B, C, D, and F. You can see that F went from 4% of all grades were F among our freshmen um, last or two years ago. Right now it's at 7%. So we see a drastic increase there and we see a significant decrease in our AIDS. Uh, very similar to last year, um, but again, last year was a COVID year. We didn't think it would make a great comparison. Um, we can continue this process if you go to the next year. Uh, again, a, a drop from um, in the A's and then um, a doubling of our F's from 3% to 7%. Um, and this is something that we, you know, we really do um, appreciate feedback from all the different groups that we do have communication with, whether it's parent groups, the Board of Education, um, of course, uh, our, you know, the uh, central uh, office, but at home and school as well. And this is something that in home and school we were having conversations with uh, just last month talking about the freshmen coming in or the sophomores, how are they with certain skills that are um, something that we would, um, you know, believe would be middle school skills that say note taking, that say listening, um, being able to listen to lecture and then go to an activity. Um, some of those, some of those skills that were robbed from them, right? Or they couldn't practice and, and uh, work on during COVID. So those are the things now that we're, we're looking to see what skills we really need to embed in our freshmen and, and sophomores. So it's not, again, just looking at content, but looking at certain skills that students may need uh, reinforced. Um, and then if you, juniors and seniors actually looked very, very similar in, in our grades. So you can see um, our 11th graders, um, again, about 50% of all grades are A's. We, 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 we like to see that. Uh, if you go to the next slide, which is our seniors, actually our seniors are actually doing better now, at least in the A's. Um, the F's, when this is really important because it's graduation, um, you can see that our F's are pretty flat and they were 2% um, two years ago and 3% this year. So very important to look at this data, but not only, of course, looking at this now, but this is what we're acting on. This is where our interventions are on, but we also need to think big picture and think about access and equity. And you can see um, we broke it down as well by ethnicity. And you can see, for example, 80% um, um, of uh, we, we, we look at certain ethnic groups, Asians, 80% of their grades were A, right? And then they're the, they're, that's the, the blue. And you can see their percentage in Bs, Cs, Ds, and Fs. Um, you can see uh, percentages, black students, white students, Hispanic students, and um, white students. And if, if we can toggle kind of quickly and from, Ms. Bodner, excuse me, from 2021 to 2019, which is the next one, I just want to show um, in 2019, right? Um, you can see that again, obviously, as we discussed before with freshmen, um, the, there, there was a drop in A's, for example, right? Um, and there's a 20% difference um, still by ethnicity in, in certain groups from two years ago to this year. So that disparity has stayed the same but what is different, obviously, is where 
one is starting from, right? So just wanted to, to point that out. Um, and then of course, um, so we, we have this for all our grades, but I just wanted to give one example of the freshmen since freshmen and sophomores were very similar. And then you can go a couple, the next slide um, is, which is with seniors. And if you recall, the senior uh, grades were better this year uh, than they were in 2019. Um, you can see that there is still obviously an, uh, a racial disparity, but if you toggle quickly, we go from here to there, you can see um, that it, it, it's very similar. So I do want to, to point that out to let you know that's, that's where we are with our first marking period grades. We are um, just a few weeks into the, the second marking period, but we are working on our interventions. And again, so appreciate the supports that we have when I didn't mention the counseling at annex, obviously two uh, teachers that were brought forth and paid for by our budget and your support of the Board of Education, Dr. Taylor and Dr. Freeman, everybody here um, were two additional math, teach, uh, math and science teacher that were added to our SLAM lab and added to our Cougar Academy Alternative School. So we thank you for that um, support. And at this point, that's where we are with the questions that were asked and um, be willing to uh, take additional questions for next time or uh, it's up to obviously board president. Joshua. Yeah, we'll take some questions to the extent that you can answer it, it'll be helpful. Um, uh, let's start with student rep Noah Moros. Hi, Mr. Sanchez. I hope you're doing well. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I just had a quick question. I know you were mentioning uh, dual enrollment earlier with some fantastic uh, universities and programs there. Um, so if the program is accepted, when would that start? So right now that we would be looking to begin the programs in the fall, right? We would be making our presentation to Dr. Freeman and the Board of Education. We did some initial exploration after uh, learning about it from board member Cuddle. Um, actually, there are some uh, opportunities for the spring, but that's a budgetary con uh, consideration because unlike the uh, Seton Hall and most um, dual enrollment courses, this would be taught by other uh, teachers outside of Columbia High School. We would need though, a Columbia High School teacher to be present in the room, kind of like a distance learning lab, but that that teacher would be more of a facilitator to ensure that students are, um, you know, completing the the assignments. Um, but it's a it's it is a synchronous program, and it would be though outside of the school day, I guess, if you will, or outside of their schedule, right? Because if um, uh, no, I hope uh, Dr. Freeman sends it to you to this presentation, or I can send it to you. You'll see that um, some of the programs are really neat and um, I don't want to say esoteric, but um, very specific that wouldn't be part of like a high school graduation um, requirement, but would be something that you would want in addition, again, as an elective to kind of demonstrate to colleges uh, and universities your interest in a specific topic. Of course, um, we would probably, right, if this would be approved or accepted, we would then uh, apply the same protocols for um, dual enrollment and how much it costs. It's uh, actually, I, and I don't want to get too far because we're just, you know, exploring it, but there's some really great uh, opportunities for us, but it would start in September. Or I'm sorry, excuse me. It, students could apply for it if approved in the spring for it to start in September, right? So you would want to know what class, what time, things like that. Awesome, thank you. No, okay. just so uh, you know, we're exploring beyond that, we're exploring some other um, uh, agreements as well that Principal Sanchez mm -hmm. and I are looking at. So there should be a, a, a vast um, array of options for students moving into the fall. Awesome, thank you. Thanks. Board member uh, Malasvina and then board member Wingfield. 
Hi, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I have a few questions. I will try to limit them as much as possible, but since they were a variety of topics. Um, the first one, we were talking about um, touchstones for graduate uh, for with counselors, and you said that the freshmen are, have the freshmen met individually with their counselors or has it just been in like a class setting type of environment? Well, I think the 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 whole idea of having um, these touchstones is to have them in not want to say class sessions, but in small group sessions. Um, so this way, they we ensure that we have them as opposed to just setting up individual um, uh, appointments, where then sometimes, uh, unfortunately, many of our students do not do not go to. So the whole idea for the scheduling, um, the whole idea of having these small group sessions was to um, have them that way. But of course, individual students are constantly in the in the guidance suite and can and can make appointments at any time. I, I understand my concern is though that we're 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 not individually meeting with each student to make sure that they are, you know, getting everything they need in an a uh in an environment uh where Sometimes children in a classroom setting don't always like to speak up or, or, you know, deal with some of the issues that might be. Dealt with in a individual type of setting. So, um, you know, that is a little concerning to me, but well, that, that's I, only for a freshman that you asked for seniors. Well, yes, it's, it's, for, it I understand for seniors, but I guess sophomores and juniors. I, so, so, is sophomores and juniors, do they meet individually? Yes, or? yes, they do. Uh, okay, so at least the freshman, I. As we're seeing with their their grades, it might be something we want to look into. Um, so um, you mentioned the start strong test, um, Dr. Friedman. Have we are we going to be getting results from that at some point soon? How are parents informed of the we, uh, results? You must have been watching the U.S. Post Office. They just delivered them today. <laughs> uh, the letters just came in. We have until January 13th to get them out. So we have to uh, put them in envelopes and send them out. So we received a, a plethora of boxes. Okay. Uh, we just separated them in our office today. Uh, in addition, um, once we uh, collect all the information and get the uh, data files um we'll be able to go through and uh, put together a, a presentation and we'll be doing that within the next 60 days. So either January or February, we'll do a report to the to the committee. Great, thank you. Um, I'm about the, sorry, I'll, I have some concerns about the profile, basically that it is missing context. I've, I've read through the profile. It, I was happy to see the inclusion of the COVID information in. I think that that's very important, especially for our children, uh, you know, compared to other schools uh, where they were in school all, all the time versus our children that were not last year. But we're missing a lot of context. And, and a lot of it is stuff that has been recommended by the um, NADA, which is the National Association of, like, and uh, college counselors and the college boards. And we're, we don't have a lot of context around our grading system, our GPA status. Um, we don't have medium like SAT stuff. I can go through all of, you know, I'd be happy to send you sort of all of the things um, that are sort of best practices that have been um, discussed with, um, you know, that I, I have some concerns about. I think that we really need to make sure that our profile is comparable to other districts around us. And a lot of these districts do have those type of things included. And we want our kids, this is an opportunity for us to brag about our kids and to really provide context to the um, colleges as to, you know, what is going on with our students. And so, um, I'm concerned that while it has improved, there's, I think, a long way that could it needs to go to make it so that it's sort of, you know, um, the best it can be so that colleges can have an understanding of how things 
you know, what is going on exactly in our schools. Um, so I'm not going to get into all the details because we don't have the time, but those, you know, I, I do have some concerns about some of the, um, the context issues. So I'll send you, if that's easier, I'll just send that over to you guys, sort of all the things um, I'm concerned about with that. Um, Thanks, and, Alyssa. Uh, Alyssa, sorry, excuse me. Um, that was three questions. I just want to get some of the others in. And if you still have outstanding ones after that, we can come back to you. Also, just to remind all of us that, sure. you know, in terms of directives, you know, uh, we well, should be I, sending information to the superintendent. Well, um, I'm sending it to the superintendent, but I. Okay, know. thank you. Um, board member Wingfield, and then Wright, and then Cuddle. Um, thank you, Mr. Sanchez, for the presentation. And I really appreciate the level of detail um, in particular that you you shared the first marketing period uh, performance data with us. I think it helped to give us a context not only for who is experiencing what, but also that comparable to the last year that students were in person, I think was a really helpful context. And the way you sort of lifted up some of those concerns, um, I think, you know, gave gave me at least some confidence that you guys are aware of where some of the hotspots may be. My question is around some of the interventions now that you have this data in particular for our students who, um, you know, are getting grades in the D's and the F's. Um, I, I appreciate that these children are on the radars of our um, administrators and our counselors, but oftentimes that awareness can be deficient in, um, in really, you know, providing the level of intervention that our young people need. So my, my question is, as a parent, if I'm a parent of one of these high school students, what can I expect class by class um, in a coherent way that my child can access to improve their grade? So, so just to give an example, you know, are there certain things that I can expect to be consistent across classrooms, like the ability to be able to make up work or to engage in extra credit activities to be able to improve my grade? Um, what are some of those things? I'm sorry, I'm just writing it down the, the questions. I want to make sure. Um, so first, as a parent, what we want to make sure is that um, it's not just a parent who happens to have um, the, the time, the ability to to contact us, right? So we need to be the ones who are contacting parents first. So I think that's that's part of that's that's part of the answer. Um, and we do that with our counseling annex. So, uh, yes, absolutely. Of course, a parent can go into the counseling annex website and sign their child up for achieve tutoring for the law for um, any specific uh, slam lab appointments during the day. Tuesdays, we have something called teachable Tuesdays where they do executive functioning, right? Wellness Wednesdays. But then we also have teachers who can do that and sign students up. We've been really um, adamant. Um, and our discussions right now, Ms. Wingfield, just so, so you board member Wingfield, so you, you're aware too, um, about the importance of the conference period as our committee, we have a scheduling committee that is looking at, you know, tinkering with the master schedule or at least bringing a proposal to central office and to the board of education. The time that we get to play with, right, is lunch and conference. And so how do we take advantage of them do we make changes? So that's why we're now keeping track of who's going to conference periods and that type of data. So then we can say, if we want to make a change, who, who could it hurt? Who can it help? Right? I mean, if we're adding another period of, of academic opportunity, but then what about that um, opportunity for uh, intervention? So to, to then answer your, your question in the, in the third way, is um, with extra credit and um, making up. Those are things that, that discussion is happening with our vice, not, I'm sorry, it's not with the parent specific, but with the vice principal and our teachers to talk specifically about best practices, to talk specifically about, okay, what are the core standards that have to be covered that, it, or I don't wanna say core assignments because then it seems transactional, but the core, concepts and standards that really have to be covered in this marking period. Um, you know, once we have that 
agreed upon and, and, we, and we think we are ready to go, we can then of course go with the parents as well in educating our parents uh, on that, on, on that card. I think that's a great suggestion and I appreciate that. Can I just ask my question again, like a really simple way? Are there certain things as a parent are, are there certain things that all teachers are expected to provide at like a classroom level, including, but not limited mm -hmm. to allowing students to make up missed work or allowing students to engage in extra credit in order to be able to boost their grade? Are there some of those things or is that that vary classroom by classroom and teacher by teacher? That would uh, vary, um, I, I would say by department. Um, and that is, so it's not inconsistent, I would say, from one biology class to another biology class, right? So I think that's that's important. Um, and it's something that we have discussed, uh, like for example, at the end of the first marking period, when we talked about not having as many incompletes or other <laughs> that we have seen in years past, and to really have those uh, grades in as, as an F, Right to, to to illustrate to parents and then talk to parents and email that to parents to say, listen, if th if they would like to make this up, we're allowing this X amount of days after the marking period, and we actually extended the marking period uh, this year to do that. So that was school wide. Yeah, yes. Yeah, Principal Sanchez, I just want to add, and Board Member Wingfield and and the rest of the board. One of the things that uh, we constantly talk with the supervisors is you know we talk about student engagement we talk about rigorous activities inside the classroom we talk about student agency we really try to de-emphasize um, the amount of extra credit that goes on inside of classrooms because we're really aiming towards mastery of content so as principal sanchez said and, and it happens in other buildings as well we're allowing kids more flexibility on making up work but we're also taking hard looks at instructional strategies inside the classroom different types of assessments, giving kids voice and choice on how they show mastery of content. And, and while that might not outwardly go out to parents, that's what we're working on internally uh, with instructional best practices. But I can tell you that just touching on the extra credit piece, uh, there's really been, we've been de-emphasizing the amount of extra credit because you know while that might boost grades in, in certain areas, that's really not focusing on building those uh, foundational knowledge skills along the way if kids are, if there's deficits from kids. So we're letting them go back and, and rework assignments and, and look at things in different ways to, to, as I said, show mastery. Thank you, board member Wright and then board member Cuddle. I just have a, a couple of questions. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Sanchez for your presentation, it was wonderful. Um, but I do have a question, like, what exactly are you doing for students who are struggling? You know, in terms of the interventions that's working and for Dr. Friedman, my question is, you know, we know what's happening at the high school, but district wide, how are kids doing and what district wide interventions are occurring at the, the other schools? That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, board member. Right? So, um, the, the same, uh. Policy, and I don't want to say policies, but the same protocols that we followed uh, with attendance is how we're following with grades. So on our uh, Thursday meeting with uh, the vice principals, we have a spreadsheet and it's grade by grade. And so what you um, have seen is just the, ag the aggregate information of letter grades, but we have it by student um, with D's and F's. And so, for example, when you when it says that you know eighty percent might be a grade, that includes one student, right, who has eight grades this marking period or seven grades. So we'll we'll see each student individually in a, in the class that they have a D or an F in. We see the actual number grade. So, for example, is it a fifty eight? Is it um, a, a 71? So, I'm sorry, it's not a C minus, but like a, a 69 or um, right, a D plus like that. We'll see it by teacher and we see it by department. This allows me to work right with the assistant principals who then tackle it by, by grade. We can sort it by department. And so when I meet with the supervisors every two weeks, we can also talk um, at that level. And then what we then do 
is, you know, they go off for that week, they start tackling it. And then we start to have individual meetings with students, we, with counselors, with teachers about those grades, because we really need, so we're, we're actually doing it at, at, the, at the most granular level with, with students um, and their teachers, not necessarily looking at it by right now, right? By ethnic group and by, by Fs and Ds. We're having those larger conversations with parents, uh, still with our teachers and counselors and stuff, but right now we don't have time. It's, it's the second marking period. And so we're trying to intervene um, as much as possible. And so what does that mean? We, um, board member Wright, are, are they hungry? Are our students not have a ride? Do our students um, need uh, support, tutoring, get, making sure even though there's a wait perhaps on a certain section that they get in, make sure that they, uh, we find a SLAM lab. Um, we, we've created additional programming like AP Core for our students who might be struggling in that first AP class that they've, they've taken. Um, and so we have paid teachers as mentors uh, through Ms. Hicks's program to, to help uh, guide some of our students, as well as to, let's say, you know, run AP US or AP Calculus or AP Statistics, and they run study groups with those students. So board member Wright, I just want to jump in and uh, for time purposes, I, you know, I want to expound. I'll just give you some examples and we can dig deeper if we have more time or I can send the collective uh, committee um, some more detail on it. But we have academic intervention, as you know, in K to two and in six to eight. We use an online program for reading intervention K to 12 called Freckle, which has been implemented um, across the district um, led by Dr. Bean folks. Uh, as you know, we have a pretty robust INRS program going on, which creates individual plans for students, and we meet with students in need. Uh, there's Achieve Tutoring, which is taking place after school. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll, um, Ms. Bodner and I are going to update you on some of the data that we found uh, in getting some tutoring opportunities in place in the evenings on the, in the weekends. Uh, one of the programs that we are putting in place, hopefully in the next month or so, is a reading intervention program in grades uh, three to five. Um, that will be uh, after school. Uh, in the afternoon, we are just um, negotiating with Samea right now on a, uh, a dollar amount for those um, reading intervention teachers. Uh, and. As I mentioned, uh, you know, overall the tutoring opportunities, uh, we're going to have tutoring opportunities, uh, not only heavily at the secondary level, but we're looking to do some tutoring at the upper elementary as well. So we have a pretty robust uh, support system going on um, K through 12, but uh, very specifically also K through 8 to really build those executive functioning skills and uh, the, the academic growth that we want to see to set them up for success in the high school, 9 through 12. But thank you, but which have the most impact and for what grades and skills and students? Oh, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of biased. I think everything that we uh, have in place has uh, been pretty impactful. I, the, the Freckle has been very popular. As I mentioned, that's an online reading intervention. The acad academic intervention teachers are wonderful in our district. Uh, the K-2 program and the 6-8 to program are very successful. We're seeing growth in both of those areas. Uh, as you notice, we don't have academic intervention teachers in 3-5, to five, so that's why we're building this reading, reading intervention after school program to really target those students so there's not a gap in support there. Uh, I feel the work that we did previously with Dr. Alegria to really revamp our INRS process. Uh, I hear very positive things from the INRS teams at all the buildings. Um, and, and when I meet with Achieve and, and Ms. Bodner and I meet with Achieve, they tell us that their numbers are some of the highest they've had in years for uh, after school tutoring. So uh, if students keep coming back, I would have to make the assumption that 
that uh, they enjoy it and it's been pretty successful for them. So everything that I mentioned, I, I think um, always has room for growth, but I, I feel that uh, I, you know, I don't have any specific data in front of me right now. I didn't know that question was going to come up, but I'm pretty confident that all of those are helping our students learn and grow. Dr. Freeman, if I can add from the high school if perspective. May, if I may say, if I may say, I understand what's in place, but how is it working? And popular is different from impactful. And I was hoping to hear specifics uh, than general data, but thank you. I was just going to add from the high school perspective, uh, Ms. Wright, uh, and I don't know what it's, what it was before because it was started uh, last year and thanks to the support of, of, of Dr. Taylor and our Board of Education, but adding a social worker to the guidance staff adds obviously the value added element of, of social um, of interns because it's a capacity issue for us at the high school. For us to have that extra person to um, ensure that that student is, and I know it might sound silly, but walked from one class to SLAM lab, or to ensure that that student um, gets the support that they need and checked in, in addition, of course, to the case managers, the, the, the guidance counselors, the, the teachers who are doing that in their extra time and, and help. I mean, everybody is working, you know, tirelessly, but that I will say is a tremendous, tremendous addition that we've had at the high school. And I, 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 I so appreciate it, even with, for example, um, our Cougar Academy um, program, we have a special intern just dedicated to that program. It's incredible and a great service. So, um, uh, you know, I, I just wanna thank you for, for that and thank the board for that support. Cause that is something that we can honestly say um, of course, everything's honestly here, but <laughs> that came out weird. Uh, we could say that it, it's a, a tremendous, tremendous impact for, for us in supporting the great work of our teachers and counselors. Great, thank you. Uh, Board Member Cullen. Uh, thank you, President Joshua. I will be brief in the matter of time. Um, I just want to thank uh, Principal Sanchez for the presentation. Um, and also uh, thank uh, Principal Sanchez, uh, Dr. Friedman, and Ann Bodner for their commitment to do enrollment um, and exploring these options for students. I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity. So thank you so much for that. Um, and I hope in the future we also explore additional opportunities um, not just beyond dual enrollment, uh, Within those traditional sense of potential new partnerships with um, state colleges and HBCUs, um, but other um, VOTEC opportunities. So thank you for that. I think these are wonderful opportunities to move our district forward towards 21st century learning. Um, so thank you. Um, I you know just wanted to also um, just comment, not a question, but if I may comment. Um, within the presentation um, on, on the breakdown as well. Um, and just kind of pause and reflect for us as a district. It is wonderful that we expand additional AP opportunities and expand our portfolio for students um, to achieve additional higher levels of attainment. Um, but also be mindful that we're accessing opportunities for students of all levels and making sure we keep that in the forefront at the same time because um, i think that's really important because all students have promise um, all students have the ability to thrive if we give them the opportunity inside and outside of the classroom i believe wholeheartedly that all of our students um, have the potential to be their best selves and uh, we don't have students who are one or the other and so i say that because uh, when we are talking about investing in our students, whether the tutoring programs or updating our curricula, um, that we're looking at expanding all of our students' needs to the future with a guide and a lens towards letting all of our students be their best selves where they are at and helping them move forward. Um, because we, all of our students matter. And so I just wanted to make a comment about that. 
Um, but thank you so much for the presentation and our continued commitment for all of our students. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Board Member Masmina, your hand is down. Are you good? Uh, no, wait one second. Wait one second. Wait, 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 wait. wait. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, oh, oh, good. I wasn't muted. I didn't know if I was muted or not. Sorry about that. I, my computer screen moves. No, um, I, I have just one more, um, thing, which is to reiterate, I think what Miss, um, uh, right was saying, which is that I, I really am concerned that we haven't we we've seen one school, but we haven't seen the data for all the schools. And I just want to make sure that we're doing, we get an, a, an idea of how all of our children are doing and not just our high school students um, in terms of grades and that we're making sure that we are not falling back into the pattern of making this an individualized school issue where, you know, I'm happy to hear Mr. Santos is doing all of these great things at, at CHS to help with the children, but um, I want to make sure that we as a whole are are doing this and not it just being, you know, like one school is doing one set of interventions and other school is doing another set of interventions. That there's some commonality that is occurring so that our children are getting what they need to succeed and that we don't have as many kids failing moving forward and, you know, that we catch it early instead of us being reactive instead of proactive. I. I can just tell you in brief that um, probably the the biggest thing that I focus on on a daily basis is keeping equitable practices happening across all the elementary buildings and and the middle middle level buildings. You know, since I since I came to the district, I can you know there was definitely inconsistencies, and I think we've made great strides, and we can bring some data forward. Uh, on how students are doing, uh, you know, the examples that I shared tonight of how we're supporting students um, that might be struggling or, you know, just to, to elevate them to higher levels. Uh, you know, I think we have a lot of good things in place, but I can tell you, uh, and you can confirm this, I mean, with the building principles, we have these conversations uh, on a weekly basis about um, maintaining uh consistent programming across the buildings and the supervisors have those marching orders almost on a daily basis from us so i can assure you that uh, great strides have been made and will continue to be made uh, for consistent practices things like atlas just where now there is um a uh, you know a, a common portal for everyone to this look at similar curriculum we have uh, common resources at buildings. Um, so uh, your, your point is well taken and uh, we will share some of those things in the future, but I can assure you that we're making uh, progress every day to, to get the consistency. Great, thank you. Uh, it is 808 and we are now getting on topic uh, number three, so let's Move with a little more haste, everybody. Crisper presentations and crisper questions. And back to you, Dr. Friedman. Thank you. Uh, these will be quick. Uh, there's some approvals that you have in the share drive for approval. There's some uh, curricula um, humanities grade nine, creative writing for grades nine through 12, and poetry for grades nine through 12. There is um, an approval for uh, the CHS band trip, which is taking place uh, later this year and uh, was vetted by SLT and um, Nurse Porter. Uh, so we really made sure that um, all the protocols and all the guidelines were met before bringing this forward. Uh, There's also two new class proposals. Uh, intro to biotechnology and honor statistics, which are STEM courses, which um, uh, we're bringing forward for approval as well. Uh, so um, that's it for approvals for December. Great, thanks. Auditory. Sure. Anne, would you mind bringing up the presentation?
So Ms. Bodner and I wanted to um, just update the board and kind of circle back from um, the discussion last month, because I know there was some, a little bit of hesitation and then it carried over to a uh, board meeting um, discussion from some of the SEMEA members. But if you remember, one of the things that we mentioned to you is that we were going to reach out and survey the, the middle school and high school staff um, to see the, um, of their interest in uh, tutoring uh, in the evenings and weekends. So uh, these slides, we just, I know that you have this presentation, but we just wanna briefly go through these and kind of overview the data that we collected. Um, one of the suggestions from many board members was instead of using a third party uh, to really use our own staff. And, and while we agree with that and completely welcome that because the, our teachers know our students best, um, you know, we felt it necessary to go out and collect this data to kind of see where we were uh, with middle school and high school teachers at this current time uh, for tutoring opportunities. Uh, we want to assure that um, all days of the week, um, Sunday through Saturday, that we are providing tutoring opportunities at various times throughout the day, not only after school, but if students have extracurriculars that we want to provide evening and weekend hours. So the survey collection, uh, we sent out a survey uh, through the building principals who shared with the staff members. It was a Google form. So myself and Ms. Bodnar were able to collect the data. Uh, it went right back to us. It was open from November 17th through December 2nd. 297 teachers re uh, received the survey. We collected 151 responses. Um, of those responses, 102 uh, indicated to us 102 teachers between both middle schools and the high school indicated they were not interested in uh, tutoring opportunities um, with our students and there were 49 that were interested in tutoring. There are, when we broke it down and, and Ms. Bodnar can touch on this briefly, um, there, were, there were 266 time slots and 68 subject areas in classes. Uh, four sessions throughout an evening um, to cover all time slots and all content areas and subjects uh, for middle school and high school. So this is the uh, breakdown. And you wanna jump in real fast and just talk about this? I think you're muted if you're trying to talk. We go. I'm trying to unmute myself. So we went through um, everything. I think something to bear in mind is when we asked teachers for their um, availability, they could check off all the different times during the week that they were available, but they could also check off all the subjects that they could uh, possibly tutor in. So unless we created a schedule for each student, uh, each teacher, we wouldn't be able to match that up. So the amount of subject or amount of sessions is is a bit more than what would be actual if we gave somebody a schedule. So we just took um, all the different classes that we would need tutoring in, asked teachers what they would do. We have the number of sessions per week um, of what teachers could possibly do during in math. Um, we At this point, we do not have anyone for AP Calculus or AP Stats. Um, for ELA, we have no one for um, eighth grade ELA, but we have, you know, significant, especially in the high school level, we have quite a few um, for four sessions. So it's four hour long sessions or each one of these is an hour long. Um, social studies, there's a significant amount, but there are also some people who could do any social studies support. Um, sciences. Um, we have some key areas for science in the high school. Um, this tends to be a huge area. Math and sciences tend to be a huge area that needs support, especially um, we're finding that in the SLAM lab. Um, world languages, uh, there, there are many, um, but I had to use a second slide to just show the areas that we're still in need. So we have a lot of foreign language classes. 
um, and do need some um, support in certain areas that are a, a bit outside of the box. And that is, that's all the subjects and all the slides that we have. So the reason we the reason we wanted to show all of you this evening, you know, we wanted to a we wanted to follow up on what we told you we were going to do from last month, and we kind of wanted to give you a visual of where we stood. You know, one of the one of the um, proposals that we're going to bring forward next month uh, in really talking to SLT and specifically Dr. Taylor about this is that you know with the overarching need to try to fill in these gaps. Um, you know, we're hopeful now we're encouraged by this data that we have uh, a few more teachers than, than we expected. So we're going to be able to use a blend of not only our teachers, but um, use that in conjunction with a, uh, a tutoring company. Um, and, you know, we're going to continue to explore. We've uh, since we've last spoken, we've looked at two or three other tutoring companies. Uh, to really get a, um, a wider range of comparisons of what they offer and don't offer. But um, this data, I think, you know, accurately shows you the need to kind of fill in gaps uh, where um, there are subject areas that we really don't have any teachers and, and don't have any interests. So um, I think we're in a much better place uh, than we were last month. Um, in terms of interest, and we'll continue to update you uh, moving forward as we move in, uh, move into next month. Uh, probably seeking approval for some type, some type of partnership with um, a tutoring company. And uh, if there is an update on any of the data, there's increased interest. We'll let you know. But we we are anxious to get this started and to provide that to support to teacher uh, to students. In the middle school and high school level, um, the next phase, once we get that up and running, we want to look at support at the upper elementaries as well, but we want to kind of gauge um, how well um, received the uh, middle school and high school tutoring are first. Hey, Santa Freeman, uh, board member Mousmina and then Cuddle. Um, I looked at the questions that you asked on the survey. It didn't show anywhere about pay. Did we mention that they would be paid? Did we give them a range of what pay would be? Because, you know, teachers uh, so might, you know, like to know what they're going was, to do. Yes, that, well, I'll be, complete, I'll be completely transparent. Um, the feedback that we received, so I can tell you that uh, Patrick Carrig is continuing to negotiate with Somea on a um, on a price for tutoring. Dr. Freeman, have... if I may, if I may, just I think that's enough oh, on that part. He's negotiating. Okay. Start, so I don't want to yes. do that in public. So that's ongoing. That's ongoing. But what what I guess the question was, I understand there's ongoing negotiations related to the amount, but when we. I didn't see anywhere in those questions that you gave to teachers like, hey, we will be paying you a this amount or above type of thing. So I think I'll just say I think the general yeah, expectation I'll, is that anything outside of their standard duty results in some sort of in the, in, I think we in the email that. to the yeah, in the email to the building principals uh, that was clearly stated, which they all shared with the um with the teachers and we couldn't put a pay range because it's uh, being negotiated right now. Okay, I All just right. board member cuddle and then board member Ray. And Joshua, um so Dr. Friedman, I guess um, my I guess my um I thank you for the presentation that I guess um my question slash comment is um the re return response seemed low to me. Um, and I don't know if it was because during the time frame, the season of the year, so to speak, um, it, or there was something more involved in that. And if so, will there be a repeat? Maybe, um, you know, uh, throwing out the questionnaire again uh, within a different type of 
seasonal time frame to see the responses and how that maybe captures a different purview. And then uh, the other part of that would be, um, you know, uh, under 50 uh, educators based upon the presentation that were potentially interested in the program. I don't work in the district, I can't speak for that, but um, just uh, hearing from our uh, vast community, there is support for a um, internal community-based um, tutoring program. And so perhaps, um, I don't know if we've looked into if we're going to potentially do a second round um, in the new year of questions, we'll look at how we're framing the questions differently, how we are um, really seeking that out, um, just sending that out via email and then perhaps asking um, uh, principals or other leaders to emphasize that. I don't know how well we encourage them to do that and how well they encouraged people to participate in this type of you know survey um i think that has a lot to do with that too uh surveys are only as good as how they're written but also um the responses that re they receive so that's something for us i think to look at um i know it there are are other opportunities for us to seek additional support for tutoring. Um, but to be fair, um, and I really appreciate the effort, uh, effort and work on this. Um, I, you know, I'd like to believe there's more than less than 50 potential interest, interested um, parties that may want to be involved. So maybe it's a matter of advertising other things, but. Um, just wanted to throw that out there. It's um, even before my tenure on the board and during my tenure on the board, uh, internally and externally, I know that there's been a big support around tutoring. Uh, I just maybe there's a different way of capturing that or trying to figure out how we lasso that uh, to get people interested in that. Um, so just wanted to like that. But I thank you for that, um, uh, trying to do that outreach. But this is something that's been ongoing before my time and it'll be post my time currently um but there really is um a large swath of our community internally externally that really want to try to help with this process so i just wanted to flag that and thank you yeah and i i i appreciate that feedback um you know we can take a look at um some alternate ways i i can tell you that um myself and miss bodner met with the three principals uh, in addition to sending out the, you know, the survey link, and we really made sure that there was a common message going out. And I can just tell you from from the two middle school principals and high school principal, uh, and you know, all three, they're very hands on with their staff, and they encouraged them to fill it out. They gave them time to fill it out. Uh, we actually extended the deadline um, to try to get more responses, um, but it, you know, we can't mandate. Um, them filling out an, a, a survey. So we encouraged as much as we could. We gave time. Uh, it, it was a pretty short survey to, you know, it was, it was collecting crucial information on um, not only interest, but content area that they could tutor and, and availability, you know, would give us a framework of what we had and, and the direction we needed to go. Uh, I think they're, um, you know, I, listen, I, I'm like you, I wish uh, the numbers were higher. Um, I, I think it's going to be dependent on how negotiations go in terms of uh, in monetary, which we talked about earlier, but we'll see, you know, and we're going to keep trying. I mean, it's not going to be a one and done attempt. I mean, it's going to be an ongoing process of, of trying to get people uh, to the table to to build our pool of tutors internally. So, you know, while at first we might need to supplement with, you know, an outside source, I, I can assure you that, um, you know, my preference, like yours and, and many others, is to, um, 
you know, and have, have internal stakeholders working with our students that know our students the best. But we'll keep trying and uh, we'll, we'll you know, continue to see how it goes. Thank you, board member, right? Uh, thank you. Uh, listen, uh, tutoring works for those who attend. What are we actively doing for those who are in class and don't or can't attend tutor? The other thing is we keep bringing programs and not developing teachers' capacity to work well with each other, to work with students, especially those of color, and which strategies work for, for those groups and, and, and the grade and the skill. We keep hearing about collecting surveys and letting teachers choose topics in December to then do that in their PLCs after January. So what are we doing during the day for the kids now? And how is it working? It's December and we should really know these things. Thank you. I think for time purposes, you know, we can reach out to uh, the board, um, board member Wright. Uh, you know, I, I think that a lot of the, most of the conversations uh, through professional development opportunities and instructional strategies and what the different um, principals have shared, I think we're working on a daily basis to meet the needs of the learners in, in, in front of our teachers. So yeah, that has been a, a huge emphasis uh, in terms of, um, instruction in our district but you know we can we can share more information in not only future meetings but in written form as well to you thanks um i believe the next topic is where's my agenda uh policies policies so there are four policies um up tonight um I'm just going through my notes because I can't remember if they're first or second reads, to be honest with you. Alternative education, dating violence, every student succeeds, and Title I parent involvement. Ms. Bodnar, do you have, I can't remember. Board, are they, are uh, I'm going to let policy chair board member Bergen jump in. I was just going to say. Board member Bergen. Thank you. I just wanted to clarify that the dating violence policy isn't up this month. Um, we didn't discuss it. It wasn't on. Um, we didn't have a copy of it last night for our policy meeting, and it's not in the drive okay. here. Um, we would like to see the um, feedback from the task force. Um, I don't know if the task force is still meeting, but the people who are on the task force to get that feedback before we moved it forward. Um, but the other three we would like to have for first read. Um, and they're in the drive. So if anyone has any um, comments on them, this would be a good time to share them. Seeing none. Um, thank you. Oh, board member Cuddle is out of hand or wave or. No, that's a hand. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President Joshua. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, board member Bergen. Uh, so, no, I mean, you, you addressed it. That was my concern in regards to the dating violence policy and getting the feedback. I um, just want to make a comment since I, uh, this is my last meeting with us at CNI, that as we are uh, looking at the dating violence policy, this is something that has been a very, um, that I've championed during my time before and after now on the board. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we have taken a step to make sure this is an important policy that we're looking at in depth, um, not just on surface. I'd like to thank all my colleagues um, and um, CNI committee um, and district leadership uh, for your work on this, uh, trying to move it forward. It's very important. And um, within our doing the district task force, thanking my colleagues for being able to pass that as well. Um, that led up to this point um, implore us as we're looking at these policies from an inclusive lens, of course, um, not just um, dating violence, uh, including LGBTQ plus persons, but also from a lens of intervention, prevention, crisis prevention and resources. Um, so as we move that forward, so um, thank you. Thank you, board member Sider. 
Hello. Um, okay, so we have a couple of policies that are up for second read. Uh, the policy committee met last night and we had some uh, follow up. Uh, one item that's up for second read is 2421, the career and technical education policy. A uh, discussion that we've had in the policy committee for the last night and, and the previous month was around whether or not we as a district should be promoting this uh, technical and vocational education program within our district, meaning uh, the, let's see, there's a Union County Votech School where we have a shared time relationship with. There is also the Essex County Votech School program. And right now, and, and currently, not even just right now, in the past, we've always been always kind of at a need to know um, practice within the district that certain families knew about these programs and, and other families didn't, and whether or not that's something that we want to promote. And so based on our conversation last night, I want to bring that up to the rest of the board to just have a you know a quick conversation about what our feelings are regarding promoting these programs. There is a financial cost to using these programs. And, and what do we want our practice to be going forward? Thank, uh, thank you. I guess my question is, the, I know there's a financial cost to the district. If How much, if any of that is passed on to families? And I know Dr. Taylor had to run to another meeting, so I understand yeah. it, but I just, you know, All if right. there are questions for Dr. Taylor, just before we go deep, I just want to frame, like, if there are yeah. questions that we can't answer here, that's fine, we'll just, Get them down and send them over, but you know, in terms of discussion, that that's the question I have. And I don't yeah, uh, know the answer is none. Answer. There is okay. the answer is none. There is none. The district right. covers the transportation, the tuition. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, well, remember right? I saw your hand before, so I suspect it is not about this topic. So no, I just want to wrap up this conversation first, and then we'll come to you. Is that all right? Oh, oh, yes, I just wanted to talk about the weapons policy. Okay, we will get to that. Um, board member Mousemeen, is your comment related to this? It, it is. Uh, it, it is something that um, I personally believe that we should be promoting um, this option. And um, it is are all of our, it is not utilized as much as it should be, or and, and it's not promoted very well within our district. Um, I could speak from personal experience when my son was looking into to uh, possibly going into Votech. It was very hard to find information within the district about it. Um, and there were many who didn't have information about it. And and um, while we, you know, are promoting APs and all of that, that's not always for all of our students, but but also Votech is also there are many options within Votech for our best and brightest students too. And we we talk about making it college, you know, college and career ready, but we we seem to be addressing a lot of the college ready. We don't talk as much about being as career ready. And there are some really good programs within the Botac department. And I'm not asking us to go insane, but I feel I do feel like we should have a you know, meeting or something, just outlining what is available to to our teach our, our parents so that they can make an informed decision. And I and I think or member that, Mouse Yes, yes. I, I was going to say I I one hundred percent agree with you. Um, you know, it's always been my past practice in in any district I've been part of. You know, I always take the approach: you don't know what you don't know, and yeah. it shouldn't, and it, it shouldn't be just the people that either a have an interest or stumble across it, or you know, randomly find information. So we don't have to go crazy about it, but just having informational evenings. Um, you know, I've done everything in the past from uh, having um, not this is at other districts, but having all of our eighth graders tour uh, the you know the Votech school. Um, and many came out of that experience 
saying, wow, I didn't know this existed, you know, I'm really interested in X, uh, to providing, uh, you know, parent nights where we provide information, we build those partnerships, and I agree with you. Uh, the focus really is on college and career readiness. I, I, I mean, the trends for the past three or four years, I've sat in conference after conference where uh, the different trades, uh, different businesses have gotten up and said, we're begging, we're begging students to look into these trades. Um, so I, I know the importance of it a and there are many opportunities for our top students, I agree. Um, and the, inter the intersection of all the, the STEM focused courses that we offer uh, in our schools are a great connection to a lot of the trades. And so I could not agree more and you will, you will see um, more information and in that partnership grow. Cause I think it's, I think it's important. Um, it's an important partnership to have. So thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Oh, that's where the great board member Bergen in. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Oh, thank you. I know I just wanted to point out that um, we did receive some written comments on this policy that um, SLT was going to be sent after ye yesterday's meeting to SLT to address um, some edits to it before the second read this week. Um, and I also wanted to, I know um, board member Wright wanted to talk about the weapons policy, which is a policy I've, a second read policy that I've asked for feedback on by email last week. Um, it's not the agenda tonight, but I welcome you know, getting feedback by email. We can talk about it if um, the board president wants to bring that in tonight. But um, at the meeting last night and policy, we did discuss asking um, Joanne Butler to review the policy just in response to some questions that board member Malaspina raised. So um, it will be re reviewed by legal before second read. Yeah, and um, since we have crossed the two hour mark, um, I do wanna keep it moving. Um, any other questions on the policies that are on the agenda for tonight? Uh, board member Manny. Yeah, I, I think some of the vote tech questions and I appreciate you bringing it up board member ciders uh, were centered around some of my feedback on the policy and I do think um, administration needs to think about how we're limiting our students when we're only offering these half day programs and some of the very exciting full day programs that Newark Votech offers as well as union. Um, you know, our, our, our students don't seem to have access to. So, um, that also needs to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Anything else? I guess can I, I'd like to clarify for sort of Ms. Uh, based on our conversation and policy that we received, we discussed that, but received a little pushback from administration on codifying it within the policy. So I, that was why we decided to bring it up throughout the, at, through CNI committee to see if that is something we wanted to move forward with addressing. Um, I think we should, that might be something we, from the policy committee perspective, we can take that back to the superintendent and get that, you know, sort of our play versus the uh, administration's take on that um, and then decide where we go from there. Uh, Member Cuddle. Just um, a, a quick follow up. Um, that you know, in all of our talk of Votech now and through the years, has been as um, and or one or the other, and I really don't feel that that's true. Uh, Votech is not and or or something that is the other. Votech should it be part of our institutionalized commitment to serving our diverse student body and inc including all of our students at all levels. Not some levels, not just certain levels or certain abilities that we may seem to think that we need to put them into a pipeline that can only maybe do Votech versus AP course credit. So I would really implore us as we're moving forward um, as a board that we look at Votech, that we look at these opportunities 
as the expansion of our full student body as opportunities as we would uh, include uh, opportunities in the portfolio to all of our students uh, at every level and it not and or students or other um, and the importance of that is impactful because students should be able to see themselves and have opportunities where they see themselves have a, ha, see themselves and the future they want to have at all levels um, and it's not less than it um it is equal to um, all of our curriculum so thank you all right thank you um dr freeman on to special services okay i'm going to turn it over to miss budin special services Um, so I'll be brief because I know we're at the tail end here. So all, all of our students who are receiving services. Um, um, so we're very. Hi. Sorry, is anyone else having trouble with Ms. Devine? Okay, are, sorry. I didn't know if it was just me, sorry. Um, you know, maybe it yeah. looks like you're having a bandwidth issue, so we know it's okay. if you use turn the camera off, uh, it might help you talk better All right. and speed through this. Let's try that. Okay, so any better? No, still having bandwidth issues? No, we sound how, better now. Let's try it. Better? Okay. So um what I was just saying that um we're you know very happy to say that all of our students who um are in our EBR program are receiving services now. Um everybody's back running. We are still continuing to look for an additional EBR teacher because we do want to make sure that we get those missed sessions taken care of. Um, you know, we don't want to forget that. So we are still looking for someone to come and just work on compensatory services. Um, so I'll keep you updated on that as we go. I also um, had the opportunity Uh oh. Yes. I think we lost her. Oh. And Ms. Devine, Ms. De, excuse me, Ms. Devine, sorry. Um, we are now having trouble hearing you. We haven't heard anything about, I think you were gonna talk about attending the CPAC meeting, but we haven't heard anything uh, on that yet. So if you can rejoin, maybe we can come back to that. Um, okay. wait, wait, let's try one more time and then we, we might need to move on and then come back. Maybe Maybe calling in might help. Okay. Yeah, Calling yeah. Uh, Mr. Boss, can you help Ms. Badan with that? Yep, I'll send the info. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you. Let's move on to, let's I guess, the equity would be Dr. Perez. Yes. All right, so, and we'll come back to finish up with uh, Ms. Badan. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my update will also be uh, brief. I just to inform every, everyone that next week I will be uh, working presenting uh, the AP enrollment data for middle school and high school courses. And that has been a work that has been done in the collaboration of uh, the tech department, Mr. Keith Bonds, Benji Basra, along with the support of CNI. So uh, stay tuned and hopefully it won't be too long. Uh, come next week. Great. Thank you. Um, let's go back to Ms. Bedai. Okay, any luck hearing me now? Yes, we got yes. you. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna talk really fast. Okay. I got to meet with CPAC. We did a meet the assistant superintendent of special services evening. It was a great, um, it was a great evening. We had an opportunity to talk about some of the parents' concerns and areas that they were looking for information. Um, and we had a really nice meeting. So um, I just wanted to make you aware of that. 
Done. Did you get it all? Got it all. Thank you so much, Mr. Dye. Um, Great. Thank Ms. you. <laughs> Dr. Freeman, I believe that's it. That's the last thing on the agenda. Uh, well, last thing, um, and okay. it's kind of new to the agenda, but this is one of the pieces of feedback I, I think is great. Just a preview of some topics we're working on for January. Uh, we're going to be doing, um, we're inviting uh, Ms. Bean, our K-8 STEM supervisor, to talk about some of the math updates, uh, specifically around Singapore math and our partnership with Greg Tang. Uh, we're going to uh, inviting Dr. Bean folks to talk about some ELA updates and some happenings around TC and some diverse uh, reading opportunities uh, that we are embedding into our curriculum K through 12. Uh, and we are also inviting Dr. Robles, who is going to give us an ELL update along with some um, world language um, uh, changes that are on the horizon. And um, any inputs that we uh, uh, glean throughout the month um, from um, from the committee as well on things that they would like to see and discuss. Board Member Tuttle. Um, thank you, President Joshua. Uh, so, uh, and, and thank you, Dr. Freeman. Um, uh, it wasn't announced on that we have new business, but I'm assuming this is the new business portion of our meeting. Um, and so that under uh, the new business portion of our meeting, um, I did uh, previously flag uh, the concern of bathrooms access um, to uh, EC and CNI committee. And I just wanted to bring that up tonight um, in regards to uh, bathrooms and facilities and concerns that have been raised um, from the community, from um, community members, uh, students, parents, in regards to um, potential alleged facilities that might not be accessible um, to all students, uh, not just trans and non-binary students um, during the day, and students uh, allegedly that may not have been able to uh, have access to uh, gender neutral restrooms or facilities that align with their gender identity, or in all students should have access to that, not just trans and non-binary students, because all of our students should be able to have access to restrooms and facilities at any point of the day. Um, it's a health and wellness issue. Um, it's also a student uh, uh, health and wellness and safety issue. Um, and I know there's been concerns with that. Um, I know there's been dialogue um, that have, where um, perhaps there's been a difference of opinion um, through uh, on the school levels, uh, if both that access has uh, been restricted or not, I'm trying to be delicate in my conversation um, and mindful and respectful, um, uh, but it's important. And um, maybe that's not one for a dis full discussion here right now, uh, but I look forward uh, during Monday's meeting to be able to hear about how we as a district are uh, addressing these concerns, where those types of concerns go to in the portals. Uh, we know that in students um, and parents or caregivers have concerns, um, how they are addressed. And this is not just about taking the concerns um, and uh, it's not a, just a yes or no issue, um, but really are we, how are we truly within our best practices, ensuring that our um, school administration, our school staff as a whole at all levels um, have a clear understanding about the protocols um, and opportunities, uh, not just following the law of the state of New Jersey and our board policies uh, to allow all of our students, not just trans and non-binary, all of our students access restrooms and facilities and how they choose um, that best fits their needs. Um, and then how are we reporting, capturing that information and ensuring that the ongoing understanding, training and development of uh, our district is happening. Um, so I appreciate uh, under new business allowing this opportunity to raise this and I look forward to Monday's meeting where potentially we could hear more about this. Um, and I thank the administration in advance for your hard work on um, our trans and 
binary student policy implementation, um, and also our district commitment, not just for ensuring equal access under Title IX, but um, ensuring all of our students have access to facilities. So thank you. Thank you, Board Member Malspina. Sorry. Yes, um, I have um, a concerns uh, yet again about how this meeting is um, being run. Uh, I would love to see us reduce the amount of um, presentations and move more towards making sure we are meeting the board goals and district goals and reviewing that and reviewing data points that um, are needed. And um, I am also yet again bringing up the fact that we do not publish an agenda prior to the meeting for the public and others to see. Um, I really think that that is important that we do that so that everybody has an understanding of what is going to be occurring. I mean, I didn't get the agenda until like rather sort of late. Uh, it wasn't until like Friday or Monday that Friday or Saturday that I saw the agenda. So, um, That's, I, thank you. Um, board member Bergen. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add to board member Cuddle's request, um, to ask about the status of the regulations that would be implementing the transgender policy. Um, to see if they've, if the regulations have been written or revised and, and if they're, um, available on the website and, and being implemented in the schools. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? All right, uh, 8.52 p.m. Tuesday, December 14th. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. We'll see you, I'll see some of you tomorrow and all of you on Monday. Enjoy, stay safe, have a wonderful evening. Take care, good night. Thank you, you too.